We boast in nothing, not the things that we have, not the things that we know. We boast only that we know Jesus Christ, who died and who came back to life. That is all the reward that we need. That is all the gain that we need in this life. Your wounds have truly paid our ransom. Eternally grateful, O Lord our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So that's a song about reward, about gain at the end. But he doesn't talk about gain the way the world likes to think about gain. He speaks specifically about the things that we gain and that the world boasts about are the things that are not worth boasting about. And what we're going to do is, we, we, I wanted to just sing this to begin with, because I wanted to keep it in mind, because in the course of this verse, uh, this, this uh, five chapters that we're going to do, there's a lot of talk about gain, reward, the things that people get, the things that some people get more of, the things that some people get less of. And I just want to just put the f focus that, you know what, that was uh, uh, the context for the people of God at that time. And at that time, their mission set before them was uh, the conquest, the land. But that's different from the time we have now. And that, you know, uh, we don't think of, of, of the kingdom of God and the expansion of it in those same terms. And we'll talk a little bit more about this towards the end. What then is the reward? What then is our conquest, our mission field, our territory? Uh, what then is, our, our, is, is the recompense, right, that God gives us for our labor, right? Um, and frankly, it's all in these uh, lyrics that you see right now. What we're going to do today, Joshua chapters 15 to 19. I have entitled this teaching, a lot of allotments, uh, because you will see that chapter after chapter, the, the, the Israelites, they have been being um, allotted allotments, territory in the promised land, right? And, and you know, this tribe, you get this, this tribe, you get that, this tribe, you get that. Allotment after allotment after allotment, which I suspect is why uh, Pastor Kogwan took on me today by giving me all five chapters at one shot, right? This is my allotment. And, uh, you know, just, just like the, the various tribes, I will be at peace with it. Uh, and I will uh, still make fun of Kogwan throughout this whole section uh, session because of that. So we're going to read Joshua chapters 15 to 19. Uh, I have a cunning plan, and my cunning plan is if we read the five chapters very slowly, it will take up my entire one and a half hours, and I don't actually have to teach anything. But I don't think that that really flies. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually, I'm going to give you a little bit of time to just scan through the chapters very quickly. But before we do that, let me just set this a little um, uh, postural context right? Uh, give a man to fish versus teach a man to fish. Uh, when we come into Bible study, when we come into even uh, sermons, you know, when you come into, uh, uh, nowadays you used to come into the sanctuary, now you just tune into it. Just understand that um, the, the, the teacher, the preacher, the speaker of the word, you, can, you must never um, let him take the place of the actual word of God. You are not learning from, uh, you, I'm not giving you my word, I'm giving you the word of God. The best case scenario, whenever, where, as we come for Bible study, as we come for sermons and so on and so forth, is that we ourselves get sharpened in our own ability to learn, to study, to unpack, to uh, correctly handle the Word of God, right? So for example, we, we look at the Berean Jews in Acts 17, right? And um, not only did they receive the Word, so the teacher, the preacher, uh, preaches the Word to them, they themselves take that as a kickoff, as a starting point, as a springboard for they themselves to get passionate and excited about studying the Word themselves, right? And uh, just these two verses from 1 John uh, chapter 2, if you have, an, you have an anointing from the Holy One, all of you know the truth. The anointing you receive from Him remains in you and you don't need anyone to teach you. Now, uh, I, I'm not trying to put myself out of business here, uh, you know, I'll put the church out of uh, a need. We all still need the church. Jesus himself says that, you know, we are the, we are the bride, right, awaiting the bridegroom. But what I'm saying is, um, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you don't need a third-hand experience or a third-hand understanding of the Word, of an encounter of the Holy Spirit. You yourself can fully well unpack scripture. I know some people with very low education. I know some people with very, who, who otherwise would never touch a book in their lives. But when it comes to scripture, they're so ignited by that passion to get to know God better that they dig in and they dig in and they dig in and they dig in. And it's not that they don't need anyone to teach them. They, they, they know, the more they dig into it, they know one of the things that they learn is humility and it's always good to sit at the feet of other people to learn more. But the biggest joy we can take out of a session like this uh, to me, the biggest uh, benefit you can get, the best thing you can get out of such a session is uh, incrementally, session by session. You know, for me, it was cell group after cell group, sermon after sermon, BSF session after BSF session. Slowly, you start becoming that uh, workman approved to handle the Word of God, 
right? So this is the hope that currently the 100 plus of you who are in this chat uh, right now, in this, in this Zoom, uh, you know, in, in, in weeks or months to come, if you're not already a cell group leader or a teacher of, 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 of the word in some context, among your friends, among your uh, workplace, uh, uh, Bible, you know, prayer group, whatever, uh, why not? The Bible says very clearly, you don't need anyone to teach you. Of course, we continue teaching, but there is a rich word from God that is waiting to just infuse you and ignite you so that you yourself can become the teacher and preacher someday, right? So what we're really trying to do here with WOW, right from the beginning, even when we were just uh, discussing it, is not telling you what to think about the Bible. It's teaching you how to yourself come up with, uh, uh, interact with the Bible, how to yourself uh, uh, really get that richness and that passion for reading the Bible, okay? So where we're going to start now uh, on that note is, uh, oh no, not yet on that note, is let me just uh, tell you the story so far, right? The story so far, uh, as we have uh, uh, covered over the last few months at this point, it started with the commissioning of Joshua. Now Moses, my servant, is dead, right? That's uh, the, the very start of Joshua, the book of Joshua. And Joshua, at this point, uh, if you remember chapter one, everyone goes around, uh, God reminds him, the officials remind him, the people remind him. Uh, my shirt says it, be strong and of good courage, right? Um, they, they, that's the commissioning of Joshua. And now Joshua, after 40 years in the wilderness and the Israelites being led by somebody else, finally, they have a new leader, this uh, young man, Joshua, son of Nun, right? And then after that, for four verses, there was crossing the Jordan, right? Where the, you talked about, uh, remember, consecrate yourself or tomorrow you're going to do amazing things. You're going to see amazing things. Right? And you remember the, the priest, they carried the Ark of the Covenant and they stepped, they dipped their toes into the water and the Jordan, waters of the Jordan heaped up far away. And that thus began the conquest into Canaan, starting with uh, Jericho from Joshua chapter 6. And then a king after king would fall uh, with a few aberrations here and there. Right? Um, and then f uh, what we've done for the last couple of sessions was the carving up of the land, the division of the land. Right? So uh, in uh, Joshua 13, there was uh, uh, the, the division that was east of the Jordan. That means before they crossed the river, some territories were apportioned to these uh, two and a half tribes, these three tribes. Uh, and then uh, the previous week, we did uh, um, the west of Jordan, starting with Caleb. Give me Hebron, he said. Remember that one, right? Um, when you're 85, that's the kind of thing you should be uh, um, passionate about as well. And so what we're going to do for the remaining chapters, 15 to 19 of carving up the land, is the allotments for everyone else, okay? Uh, you get a car, you get a car, everyone gets a car. Allotments for the remaining uh, nine and a half tribes, okay? So, you have your Bibles. In the interest of time, I'm going to ask everyone to just take five minutes right now to where, however you're going to do it, on your phone, on your physical Bible, because we are not going to read word by word every uh, word of uh, these five chapters today. This, this particular format doesn't allow for it very well. We're going to discuss a lot of it. But as far as the, what we're going to do now, just to make sure, in case none of you have read it before, now it's uh, on my clock, it's, uh, where's my clock? Yeah, on my phone is 8.17. I'm going to ask everyone for the next five minutes to uh, read your Bible. Read Joshua chapter, uh, Joshua chapters 15 to 19, and I'll come back in at uh, 8.22 uh, p.m. Okay? So for five minutes, everyone, on time, on target, try to get through, if you time yourself, one minute a chapter. Joshua chapter 15 to 19, okay? Um, let me find some good music, some nice uh, background music for the time being. Please uh, keep reading as you go. wonder why so many people say they want to learn guitar but very few actually learn to play it's this one the mcpherson all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God In all my Of 
the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. Oh, my Once again, let me just get my PowerPoint back there. Okay, uh, we did that just so that everyone has an idea for what we're going to be talking through. Because just for today, we're not going to be going through the book uh, quite exactly in the, the same order that you read, right? Because that will be uh, more than a one and a half hour session, right? Um, as I read this uh, 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 chapters, these five chapters preparing to study, uh, to prepare for this uh, WOW session, uh, what I did, I, some questions came to mind as I skimmed through at first, right? And so these are just the first thoughts that came to my mind as, as I hit these five uh, chapters. The first thing is just this uh, real, uh, is a skill set question. How on earth do we deal with these uh, listicle passages in the Bible? You know, you know these passages, right? They are the ones that um, the tendency is to just want to just like really skip them entirely, right? Because you get all these names after names, beget after beget, and then this king after that king, and, and so on and so forth, right? And, and, and uh, it's what we call a listicle for those of us who, are, uh, do, who do uh, like internet um, publishing. Listicle is basically it's just a listicle is an article that is uh, for, in the form of a list. And some of these passages in the Bible really take on the listicle format, right? Uh, in, in this case, is the tribe inherited this, this, this. It went from this city to that city and this city had that many people and so on and so forth, right? How do we deal with that? And we're going to spend a large part of uh, this session uh, 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 equipping ourselves to deal with listicle passages, how to get something out of these parts of the Bible, which can feel very dry and very monotonous and repetitive when we read them, right? Some of the other questions that just came to my mind, and it's good for you to do this exercise. When you read a passage, um, you know, you, you just sort of zoom out and you just ask, okay, I have all of these thoughts that come out as I, as I skim through it, as I scan through it. Uh, it gives you a, a starting point to just dive a little bit deeper and dig a little bit deeper into these questions. For example, as you read it, it is monotonous, but it's not exactly monotonous. There are some parts where it's not 100% not repeated, right? There's some tribes, they are mentioned a little bit more, right? And some tribes, they get a little bit less. So, you know, it's a similar as why does Edric have to do five chapters when everyone else gets one every week of wow, right? Uh, it's kind of similar. Why is it that some tribes seem to get a larger allotment and uh, some tribes didn't seem to get a lot of allotment, right? It's a good question and we'll explore this uh, in the course of this study. Why are some specific people, so not just the tribe, but there's some people, uh, you see that like Caleb, uh, Othniel, 
uh, Zelophehad, his daughters actually, uh, and, and, and Joshua himself, they are given this special mention. And you know, the Bible isn't an accidental piece of literature. It's not, you know, an accidental collection of texts. It is a very intentional, specific, god brief uh, book, compilation of, of, of books. Um, and therefore, every word, every name mentioned there must have been mentioned for a reason. So we try to dive a little bit deeper into that. And finally, we have this thing where, you know, this does seem very old school, this, these chapters. It talks about places so far away from us. Uh, it talks about like territorial conquest. Who does territorial conquest anymore nowadays? And it has all these uh, names which are so foreign, right? Sometimes we read these parts and uh, it can feel very distant and very irrelevant. So that's uh, one of the questions that we'll try to address in the course of this uh, study. How do we uh, uh, find relevance? How do we find a uh, uh, connection, engagement with a with, uh, passage of the Bible like this? Right? So we're going to deal with this. This will be the largest part of, of what we're going to be talking about today. How do we deal with uh, listical passages? Um, there is a, a Word document, the, the, just the, the handout notes that, that I had um, prepared earlier. I sent it to Kim uh, earlier today and then I, I don't know if you've got it and maybe it's, if it's shared in the chat group. Uh, but basically a lot of these things will be in that uh, handout. You can feel free to use it to uh, fill in the blanks if, if uh, you want. Um, so how do we deal with listical passages? And in the course of talking of, through these uh, six, um, six skill sets here, these six approaches here, we, uh, I will also uh, attempt, endeavor to unpack some of Joshua 15 to 19 so that as we learn how to deal with the listicle, we'll have like a real-time uh, uh, on-the-job session, OJT, where we really are, okay, by using this particular, um, applying this particular approach to, to, to studying scripture, we're going to study it in these five chapters and then after that, the next time you reach the next listicle passage, you should also be equipped to uh, tackle it yourself, okay? Uh, right, so uh, we'll go through this in some detail, but let me just paint the big picture here. The first one is we, take a, is we respond with a snapshot. In other words, we have this huge chunk. The, what's the big picture being painted us with all of these uh, chapters, with all of these names, right? So we're going to take, a, as we approach this listicle passage, especially one that's extensive and this, uh, there are more extensive ones. The whole book of Leviticus basically is one big listicle if you think about it that way, right? How do we, first, the first thing we do is we take a snapshot. What is the big idea here? The, 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 what is, why did God put this chunk into the Bible, right? That snapshot. Two, uh, second uh, approach to it is we start to support the patterns between the listicles. What is being repeated? What is God telling us through such repetition, right? And then you realize that even as you try to spot repetition, you realize some things don't repeat. There are some things which stand out, you know. Uh, some things, you know, like in a, in a, in a, in a herd of, of white sheep, the black sheep will stand out, right? So in a case like this, after a while, your eyes start to glaze over and you start to expect the next paragraph to sound like the previous paragraph, but sometimes it doesn't. And that's where we pause and we say, oh, uh, God's trying to say something here with this discrepancy, with this uh, thing that isn't repeated, which doesn't follow the same pattern. Why is this tribe or this person uh, or this city, why is it not being treated the same as all the others that are being mentioned, right? And then we try to dig a little bit. What's the backstory here? You know, what, 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 what is it about this person, this tribe that gets such a different treatment, right? Same for, for point D, where some names are just given exceptional treatment. Right, uh, uh, just exceptional treatment, and, and we talked about Joshua and Caleb. In fact, if you remember chapter 14, which we did uh, last week, that was a special mention chapter. Uh, bit, sandwiched between 13, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, which is just tribe allotments, you get one whole chapter that's almost exclusively devoted to Caleb. Right, so that's an example of a special mention, and, and you pause and you take note, wow, there's something to learn from, from the example of this character, right? Um, E is, 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 is a sort of a vague point, but it basically means that is, at some point, you can't just uh, approach the Bible purely academically, purely like a literature text where you just break it down into stanzas and into verses, right? You have to be able to understand that the Spirit does need to speak to us in the process. And, and, and this one can and probably should be different for different people, where different people will be led to different points in the same passage, uh, because the Spirit is trying to nudge you and help you relate that particular point of the passage um, to, to something going on in your life, which is unique and different from whatever is going on in your spouse's life, different going on in your cell group member's life, right? So point is about that. Is there something there which for some reason it cries out to you saying, God says, the Holy Spirit says, wow, this is where you really need to put a finger, highlight this particular verse because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, change your life with something that you're going to learn from this particular uh, verse. 
right? And finally, after remember point at, at uh, item A snapshot, we took a step back and we took and we looked at the big picture. After all of this um, deeper diving, you know, looking for patterns and discrepancies and special mentions and all that, finally, uh, we put we step back and we just uh, summarize or, or or put into your own words or internalize or personalize uh, the principles that which you have learned. And the specific lesson for you, uh, your thoughts and your takeaways from this big listicle chunk of, of, of text. Okay, so I'm going to go in a little bit more detail on these uh, six items over here. How do we deal with listicle passages? First one is uh, we take a step back after having skimmed through it and we ask, what is the big picture being painted with this listicle? This snapshot isn't just about listicles, by the way. When you read the Bible, you should do this uh, constantly because another word for this is context. You should always be asking, what is the context of this, of this book? Like, for example, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you should take a step back after reading all 12 chapters, and then you ask yourself, what was the big picture with that book? Why did some parts of it not sound very scriptural? And you realize the context of it is you're looking at the journey of a man and his ups and downs, trying to uh, find uh, meaning and satisfaction in all of the ways, except for God, until he finally finds out that God is the only way to satisfy. So that's what we mean by that big picture, right? Now with a listicle, of course, you can, in this case, we've got a nice uh, five uh, chapter chunk here. Uh, what is this big picture? Why, what was God saying to us by putting this list in, in, in the Bible and in the book of Joshua, right? One approach to this is uh, you try to summarize what you have just read in a single sentence. Uh, this is what I tell my writers over at Thirst and Salt and Light, right? In a single headline, in a single phrase, I know a one BB teacher, uh, Jeff Chung, you know, this is what he does at his uh, creative agency. He tells them, you, you pitch your story in, in, as if you are writing a single tweet, right? So in a nutshell, what you'll say is, Joshua 15 to 19 is about, and once you sort of are able to draw it in one sentence or a couple of sentences, you kind of are able to have, okay, I've got a handle on this passage. Now that I kind of know what it's all about, I can go back in and you knowing that that's the basic framework, I can understand what is going on with the individual details in the, in, the, in the passage. So there's a few approaches to this as well, right? You could approach this at the, at the, very, at the very surface level, which is just, you just say, factually speaking, what has just gone on in this chapter, right? So in the cases of Joshua 15 to 19, the factual statement, the observation statement, the level one snapshot of it is, well, these are five chapters, which Joshua 15 to 19 is about how the promised land was divided among the tribes of Israel. And you'll be right. It is uh, completely correct. It is how the promised land was divided among the tribes of Israel. But after a while, if you keep doing this, you realize your whole Bible is going to just become a narrative session. Oh, you know, this happens, then that happened, then Jesus died, then Jesus rose again. And, you, know, you, know, you know, sometimes at some point you need to dive in a little bit deeper and get a little bit more out of that, right? So we move on to the next level of a possible way to nutshell uh, a passage. So for example, uh, uh, the next level where you start to make sense of the facts that were given, you make sense of, yeah, okay, the promised land was being divided. Let's interpret that a little bit. So Joshua 15 to 19 is about um, principles that can help us understand that there are rewards, allotments uh, for our faith and for our acts of faith. So in other words, you're not just saying that's what happened. You're saying, well, I can see, I can start to see the lines being drawn, the principles, the, the, the biggest sense of what's going on here that might transcend purely the narrative statements being made in the chapter. Okay? Then you take it a little bit deeper. After interpreting, well, okay, it helps us um, draw up principles, for example, uh, to, to help us guide our footsteps of faith. Right? You go a level deeper. Uh, the, the, the words that are underlined, I think they are blanks in the handout. Right? So the first blank would have been observation, interpretation, and then the third blank there would be, well, now that I can start to make sense and draw up some principles, um, how can I apply it? What is the application? You know, uh, that, that's wisdom, right? When you start to apply God's word, otherwise it's just knowledge. Joshua 15 to 19 is about what I can do to ensure that I continue to be in that place of God's favor. For example, I, I, this is just a snapshot. This is just a first response to, well, if I'm going to apply these chapters, maybe this is how I can apply it. What I can do to ensure I'm in a place of God's favor. Okay, so that was just my instinctive response to the five chapters. Then we go a little bit deeper, right? It's not just what I do, but it's about who I am, right? So you go deeper and deeper into, the, into your identity of Christ and so on and so forth. And then you get to the point of personal reflection. So application is for everyone. For everyone, the principles kind of apply. But the personal reflection or the personal application, 
we'll talk about specifically for me, which of these principles, which of these things that I've interpreted, that I've fleshed out, really speak to me and the things I'm going through in my life, my specific context in life, my specific family environment, my specific job situation, you know, my specific, uh, the culture I'm in, right? Um, which tribe would I fall in? For example, I've just given an example of how you could, you could, you could start to personalize and start to really draw lines between the characters and the names and the cities and the tribes being mentioned and start to see what is the specific word God is giving for me. Would I be a person of Judah or a person of Simeon? And I'll talk a little bit more about why I chose these two tribes later. Am I a Caleb? Am I a Joshua? That's a good thing if you're either of these. Do I, in, 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 in their response to things, in, in, in how Othniel charges forward and says, I want this, um, do I see myself in that? Do I see a nudge that God is giving me? to say that, hey, this word is for you and maybe this nudge is for you to just charge forward like, like Caleb, like, like Othniel, be faithful like Joshua. So what's the personal reflection uh, what if, in, this, in this passage? And then I go to point five, which is the one that we should all try to arrive at uh, whenever we read the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, um, um, narrative, poetry, prophecy. Um, what is the gospel context? So you understand this, the whole of the Bible is a redemptive arc. The redemptive arc, I've got a separate slide on this later on, but basically it's, 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 it's God created man, man fell from God. Uh, but by, the grace, by his grace, he sends grace personified in the form of Jesus. And therefore, we are reconciled. Uh, and we have uh, into eternity, into, into the Father's house. That's the narrative, that's the redemptive arc that the whole Bible follows. And you'll find in the Bible, it starts with creation and it goes to the fall and it goes through man's wandering, whether it's through the wilderness or through the exile years or, or, or you know, all the way until finally we reach the book of Revelation where it all uh, coalesces and comes together and the redemptive arc finally finds its perfect completion, its perfect fruition in the form of Jesus and the second coming at the judgment throne and all things will be made new again, right? So, now, that's a very big picture, a very big uh, uh, arc that you want to draw. But it's a very important thing that you always want to keep conscious whenever you read the Bible. Because some parts of the Bible, you can read it in too much isolation, and you forget that it's part of this redemptive arc. My, uh, I'm doing the book of uh, Jeremiah for my quiet time. If you forget about the redemptive arc, Jeremiah is a, and, and the book of Lamentations, also probably written by Jeremiah, is in isolation is a horribly discouraging book to read. Right? You think about it, and by the end of it, hey, wait a minute, no one, no one was convinced by Jeremiah. They're all still going to fall, and they're all going to go into exile. What was the point of all that? The point of all that is that it's part of a redemptive narrative. It's not the happy part of the narrative, unfortunately. It's at the part of the narrative where people fall and people keep falling. But once I put it into the big picture, then I understand, okay, then the lesson is how do I move from the fallenness and the wandering? How do I move on to the next step? Or, which is the reconciliation, which is the, the restoration, right? And that's how I draw something out of it. So if I use this kind of concept for the five chapters which we just read, I know it's really hard because you're seeing, you know, uh, towns, uh, Neftoa, Mount Ephron, Bala, which is Kirjaf, Jearim, and so on and so forth. And I'm supposed to see Jesus in all of that. How I see Jesus in all of this is I see these five chapters as a description, as a metaphor for the rest, the reward, the victory that we have in our Savior, Jesus. Jesus is Yeshua. Yeshua is another form of the name Joshua. Joshua and Yeshua, are, 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 Joshua is a type, a, 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 a pre, a, 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 a earlier sort of a format, an earlier sort of vision of what the Savior would really look like when the Savior actually comes, right? Um, and, 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 and therefore, uh, when I see Joshua as a type of Jesus, I understand that the victory, the rewards, the rest that is described in this process, it was for the Israelites under Joshua. And I draw that parallel. It is for the believers. It's for the spiritual Jews under Jesus. Right? So this is how we, uh, we, we, we try to approach it. We try to summarize it. And once you have that particular context going on, you start to realize we're not just talking about territorial rewards. We're not just talking about, you know, uh, you know, you can have this city, you can have that city. We're really talking about something much bigger than that here, right? Um, and we'll get to that towards the end of this uh, study, all right? So uh, every time we read the Bible, short passage, long passage, five chapters like this, if, you know, or whatever, right? Um, we ask ourselves this question. 
How do I see the character of God and simultaneously the grace of Jesus in this passage? Where does this passage fit into that redemptive narrative of the gospel? It's important for me to know so that I'm not stuck in the, in the bad parts of the narrative and thinking, you know what, that's the way. That was the problem of Ecclesiastes since I mentioned it. He just assumed that the wrong ways were the way. And later on, he found out, wait a minute, he was mistaken all the while. It's the same for this. We need to know the big picture so we don't get lost in, in wrong teaching. You read the book of Job, three quarters of it is bad teaching, for example, because it comes from the hearts and the spirit of men not fully surrendered, not fully in tune and aligned with God. So we need to know where it all fits in. Okay? Um, other examples of this in the Bible, uh, you have uh, the book of Laws, uh, Leviticus. You've, um, the big picture for the laws, just to give an example of how we, how, how we start to pull out and start to see the bigger picture and things, apart from just the facts that are being stated. You know, you must not eat this, you must not eat that. You, on this day, you cannot go there, you cannot that, wear that. Well, sometimes we get so lost, in the, we, 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 we miss the forest for the trees. We, what, what's the phrase? Yeah, you know what I mean. You can only see the trees, you miss the whole forest, right? The book of laws, the point of it, the big picture and why it's included there, it's not to make you feel bad. It's to help you understand. It's a, lit, it's, it's a literally long, long description, uh, a depiction of uh, the holiness standard. And in its length and its continued, the, the, the endless list of things that we can and can't do, we start to realize, my, my goodness, this is an impossible standard. Laws alone, our works alone, our performance alone, our deeds alone are never going to be able to get us fully right with God. That's the big picture of the books of, of the laws. You get books like uh, Numbers and, and, and elsewhere in the Chronicles and so on and so forth where, where they, they count the number of people. So you get, you know, for this tribe, you have X number of people. For that tribe, you have X number of people. Um, understand that a lot of those tribe head counts were, were, were of uh, fallen nations, right? We talk about, um, we talk about the, the people of Israel and they were doing their census out there in the desert in the wilderness. We talk about David and he did his, and he counted his numbers only to be told, you really shouldn't be doing that. The posture in it is wrong. But and what we get out of those numbers, we realize that actually these are numbers out of the land of promise, the people of promise, Israel. And even though they fall and they fall and they fall again, because God has promised that he will not let this nation fall without at least a remnant remaining, if not, you know, an abundance of people like, like sand on the seashore, like stars in the heavens, right? Um, he's going to keep these people alive. He's going to bless them despite their failings, despite their pride, despite their fallenness. So to me, that's the big picture of the listicles, which are the numbers books. Um, the succession of kings, 1st Kings, 2nd Kings, 1st Chronicles, 2nd Chronicles, and, and the stories start to retell themselves. You start to forget which king did what. They kind of look similar after a while. Um, if you think about the big picture, remember the redemptive narrative. This is about the fallenness of man. In the northern kingdom, there were zero good kings, right? In the southern kingdom of Judah, there were just a handful of good kings, right? The big picture here is, is that part of the redemptive narrative that talks about the fallenness of man, all right? And then you've got the genealogies, you know, uh, beget, 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 you know, for Matthew and Luke, one of them goes uh, from, from oldest, from the most recent to the, so back to Adam, and the other goes from, you know, in the reverse order, name after name after name. Then in Genesis, you've got your Adam to Abraham's, right, your Methuselahs, your Enoch's, and so on and so forth. The ge genealogies, the begets. The big picture there, in case we get lost in all the begets, the big picture that there is helping us understand that Jesus was always the end goal. Jesus was always the center point, the focus, the, the, the reason that all of those generations had to come and it was so intentional. They draw it out in Genesis and they flesh it out in Matthew and they flesh it out in Luke that, hey, all those are from, you know, who beget who and the sons of Noah were this and that and you draw the little line and suddenly, hey, David's there. You remember, wait a minute, Jesus and David, there's a link somewhere there and he draws the line all the way down to, to, to Jesus and you realize that there were no accidents in these genealogies. They were not put there to bore you at the start of the Old Testament and at the start of the New Testament. They were there to join the dots. They were there to join the dots, as you see on the right side of the screen, of all of these things. That man will fall again and again and again because we are never going to be able to meet that perfect standard of holiness. But God blesses us despite all that. And the biggest blessing he has, and it was his plan all along, was the gift of grace, our Lord Jesus Christ. So don't get lost. Don't, don't, don't only see the trees. Understand, see the forest when you reach a passage like this, right? I'm at A out of F with uh, 45 minutes to go. I can do this. Okay. Spot the patterns. What is repeated? What might God be telling us through the repetition in these chapters? Okay. Um, 
one of the, the, the tips that I'll give to you is if you can, be, be comfortable dirtying your Bible. I learned this a few years ago, maybe about 12 years ago, and, and uh, your Bible study really goes up leaps and bounds when you have a, a, a dirty Bible. Dirty Bible, clean heart, clean heart, dirty Bible, right? Um, one of the things you can do when you highlight verses, you draw circles and you put little footnotes. I, I've been teaching, my, my wife actually is very good. She teaches the kids to do this. Uh, she's very intentional about it. When uh, we talk about our, during our quiet time and, she, and then she say, I say, oh, you know, this verse is also in, in, in Re Revelations. Then she'll say, write that down, write that down. And what happens is as you read, you, you start to draw all the lines and you start to see all the repetition. So again, I said, we're not going to read um, the passage out loud through. But as you read it, hopefully you would have noticed that some of these repetitions, uh, these are repeated um, themes or repeated sentences happen again and again, even in these five chapters. So let me give you the first example there. The first example of repetition is this thing that's rep repeated. The concept that some of the tribes could not dislodge the existing Canaanites or whoever was in the land, the Jebusites, right? Um, uh, and, and the other uh, repeated point that comes with that same sentence is always that to this day, the day that the book of Joshua was written a bit later on, um, to this day, those people are still there, right? So not only could they not dislodge them then, since then we haven't been able to dislodge them. That's what uh, the repetition means, right? And you realize, actually, it's, 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 you know, once it's, it's bad enough, twice, it, maybe it's a coincidence, but by three times, I think there's something that is happening among the various tribes, and, and there's a lesson here to be learned out of this repetition, right? You see, one of the things that is repeated, not in these five chapters, but in later on in the Bible, is that there are consequences to these uh, people, the Canaanites, not being dislodged. So that's repeated too. So for example, uh, in that first paragraph there in 2 Samuel 5, 6, the Jebusites would remain an irritant, you know, uh, even until the time of King David. King David is 400 years later, around 1000 uh, BC, right? Uh, and even then, they still inhabited uh, uh, Jerusalem, which was their main city at that time. And at that time, when David marched in on Jerusalem, they were still mocking David 400 years later, still there irritating their king. And they said, we don't even need our strong people to repel you. Even our blind and our lame people can, will repel you. Because frankly, in the time of Joshua, you weren't able to do it. In the 400 years that followed, you weren't able to do it. And you're still not going to be able to conquer us now. That's what the Jebusites were saying. Same for the Canaanites of Giza. In fact, they lasted there even longer. They lasted there until the time of Solomon. And even at the time of Solomon, it wasn't Solomon who could conquer the people in Giza. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, the Egyptians. The Egyptian pharaoh, unnamed pharaoh came, conquered land. Handed land over to Solomon and said, nah, this is how you do it. You know how Pai say that is, right? God's people can't even do it themselves. Egyptian Pharaoh has to come and do it, right? Uh, in, in Ezra chapter 9, um, the, the Jews were chastised for their, in, for, for their uh, intermarriage. Ezra is far down the road, by the way. Ezra is like, what, four 500 BC? Um, uh, There's almost, almost a, a, a millennium later, right? Um, the Jews were chastised for their intermarriage with pagans. At this point, uh, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of land with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites and the Jebusites I mentioned. So, not only did these people remain there, the Israelites got so used to them, the Jews, they got so used to them, they started to marry them, make friend, make friend, um, started to borrow some of their customs, started to worship their gods. That was what happened. There are consequences to this. Uh, you know, in, in the book of Joshua, the chapters that we read, it's just a one-liner, right? Oh, they weren't able to drive them out and they're still there. But now we see what that they're still there really means. They're still there. Their gods are still there. Their customs are still there. Their mockery of the Lord our God is still there. Right? So what we learn here is when God tells us to deal with something, it's for our own good. Um, do we really want to live with consequences which can last for years or even uh, the generations? We know Exodus 20 verses uh, 5 and 6 curses... Uh, to the third and fourth generations, but blessings to the thousandth generation, right? Where we can choose blessings, we can deal with something and it's for our own good. Or we can reap the consequences of not dealing with something. At this point, usually the, the teacher will give an example of, of habitual sin or of a generational sin. And I think we, we do that a lot already in our church. You know, we, we teach about RTF and so on. Let me give you a positive example. I just want to, my wife hates it when I mention it. I'm just going to use her as a, as, a, as a positive example. She's in the next room. I expect her to come storming in quite soon. Uh, she, she helps out with uh, one of the Saturday KFC groups. And, uh, you know, one of the things my wife isn't great at, she's not great at technology. But right now in this season, I'm looking at a door because I'm just wondering when she'll, she'll storm in. No, I'm kidding. Joanne, I love you. Yeah. Um, one of the things that she has had to, to, to uh, level up with is technology, right? And so, you know, for the Saturday KFC, they don't gather. So she has had to learn to deal with technology. 
and it's 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 for their own good, right? It's so that they can send out videos and and engage with the Saturday KFC kids and so on and so forth. So I'm so proud of her. Over the last two weeks, she spent many evenings just uh, setting up the 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 cameras and the selfie camera, for getting a script together, wondering should I put the whiteboard here, the whiteboard there, and in the end, you know, you could not do it, you could not deal with it, and and you know, at the end of the circuit breaker, let's say phase three, three to six months later, whatever it is, the poor Saturday KFC kids still would not have had a video to watch. Or you can deal with it. You can do it and it's for your own good. In, in the case of the kids, they get, get something to engage and watch. In the case of my wife, she levels up. She's got a new skill set, a new uh, weapon in the arsenal when it comes to teaching the kids. That's great, right? So positive example, deal with things when God tells us to deal with them. Don't, don't let them simmer. Don't let them uh, uh, eat away at us until the time when we can't do anything about it anymore, which was the case here with the people who remain in the land, right? Uh, contrast this with the example of uh, Dan, not Dan Fu, not Dan Ko, the tribe of Dan, right? Um, Joshua 19 is basically about, you know, the various tribe allotments. And Joshua 19.48 just talks in this uh, parenthesis, almost as a aside, a throwaway comment. It says, well, uh, Dan kind of went through that as well. They kind of lost some territory. But you know what? They didn't just uh, say, you know what, um, I guess it's too tough. I think we'll just let them be. They got up again. They picked up their swords. They picked up their spears. And they just show out one more time. If God says this is the land for us, then this is the land for us. They went to the, the Leshem. They took it. They put it to the sword. They occupied it. They settled in Leshem. And they said, you know what? Forget Leshem. What does Leshem even mean? Let's call it Dan after our Kong Kong. Right? Dan. Right? So that's what they did. Positive example, right? Not like the others who let the... The, the negativity, the evil, the wrong, the wrong gods, the wrong idols stay in their land. They did something about it. They dealt with it. Right? Uh, in fact, Leshem was never again mentioned in the Bible. One of the good things about technology is you can search for names in the Bible very easily. You go to your Bible app, you just search Leshem. It's only mentioned once or twice in, in, in the course of, twice actually, in the course of this verse. And that's it. After that, there was no more uprising, no more agitation. Whereas if you search for Canaanites, it keeps appearing throughout the Old Testament, you know? Right? In fact, Leshem still exists today. It's a, it's, a, it's a modern day town. It's one of the new settlements. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's no negativity associated to that land anymore. They deleted, they got rid, they rebuilt uh, that which was wrong about that place and they replaced it with what was good. C, search for discrepancies. So in B, we were searching for similarities, right? Repeated patterns. In C, you look in a passage like this where your eyes start to glaze over and all that, you can search for things which are different. So in a list of repetitions, in fact, it's quite easy to spot discrepancies because suddenly you reach a paragraph that didn't sound like the last 10 paragraphs, right? And there you should really pause because there's a reason that was inserted there by the author uh, of, of, of the book, right? Most of the territories as you skim through, you will, they will have been described in very similar fashion. So for example, if you skim through uh, Joshua 19, it's really repetitive. If, when I look at my Bible, it looks almost exactly the same. It's like six verses or something uh, per tribe, uh, the land of Zebulun, the land of Issachar, the land of Asher, and it's very repetitive, right? Um, but there are two tribes in particular, which get a, a, a lengthier explanation for how they got to where they are, right? You look at the tribe, uh, sorry, the, the table on your right, the table on the right, the, the, the first column numbers from Numbers chapter 1, that was the census at the start, uh, early on into the Exodus, right? And you could see at that point, early on into the Exodus, uh, the tribe of Simeon was uh, number three in terms of the population of the tribe, right? If you're wondering, uh, those little footnotes there, there's 11 because they didn't do a census for the Levites who were given over to God, right? And uh, we, these numbers are only men. They say these are the men of Israel. We, we don't know about the women and the children. We don't know whether they say men, whether it means male men only or humankind men. But So we just have this number to work with. Simeon was number three. And the half-tribe of Manasseh, which is of course a, a half-tribe with Ephraim, uh, they are the sons of Joseph, right? Um, half-tribe of Manasseh was the smallest of the tribes at that time, of the recognized tribes at that time, right? With a good uh, 27,000 disparity between the two tribes. By Numbers chapter 26, and if you, you look at the numbers in Numbers 26, where they do a, uh, uh, the census across from the Jordan from Jericho. So it was really close to the, to the conquest, right? You will see that um, Manasseh has climbed up. They've gained the, 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 the biggest gainers there, right? Uh, 20,000 people they've gained to a respectable sixth place amongst the tribes. But Simeon, Simeon was the biggest loser. Um, they lost 37,000 people in the course of, uh, of, of the Exodus, right? They, and they dropped right to absolute rock bottom, last place, number 11 in the list of tribe sizes, 
uh, by Numbers chapter 26. Um, so already we know, if we had actually looked at the numbers, that there was something interesting going on with these two tribes. And what happens is in, the, in Joshua's uh, 15 to 19, these two discrepancies are actually highlighted. They spend, uh, the author spends much more time talking about these two tribe sizes, or rather has special mention of these two tribe sizes to explain this, this particular scenario. Why is it that, they, that, that Simeon plummeted in the numbers, whereas Manasseh got such favor, right? So uh, as you search in the discrepancies, this is from Joshua chapter 17. In Joshua chapter 17 is when we say the people of Joseph, remember the people of Joseph basically means the two half tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. But the people of Ephraim already got their inheritance out there in the, uh, in the land east of the Jordan, right? Tribe of Benjamin missing. You're right, Pastor Seng Lee. It might have uh, fallen off when I typed it in. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I, I'll need to revisit my tribe. I think I might have uh, deleted one line by accident. Thank you, DSP. That's why you're DSP. Excellent stuff. Um, sorry, I manually compiled this earlier this afternoon. Uh, right. So, so anyway, Benjamin was, was a number there as well. Okay. Uh, this, in Joshua 17, you see the people of Joseph basically means the people of Manasseh because the people of Ephraim are already east of the Jordan, right? So uh, the people of uh, Joseph said to Joshua, hey, why have you given us only one allotment, one portion for an inheritance? We're a numerous people. The land has blessed us abundantly. Uh, and so uh, Joshua answers, well, if you're so numerous and if the hill country of Ephraim is too small for you, then go up into the forest, clear land for yourself there in the land of the Perizzites and the Rephites. In other words, if you want extra inheritance, extra territory, extra land. It's all yours. Go and take it. Now, the people of Joseph replied, um, well, that hill country is not enough for us, right? So firstly, I saying, we want more than that. And of course, they, they point out that, you know, there's Canaanites there. They live in the plain. They have chariots and so on. But Joshua said to the tribes of Joseph, he's, he's still talking to the whole tribe, I guess, at this point, to Ephraim and Manasseh, you know what? You have so many people here. You are numerous. You are powerful. You will not only have one allotment, but the forested hill country as well. Just go take it, clear it. The furthest limits will be yours. Though the Canaanites have chariots fitted with iron and though they are strong, you can drive them out. Um, so one of the things we notice here about the tribe of Manasseh, the half tribe of Manasseh here, is they had the boldness to ask for more, right? They had a, a, a battle to uh, uh, claim, uh, uh, they, they, they were told by, by Joshua that they had a battle to fight before they, they could claim that, tri that, that land, right? Um, but one other thing that we want to know about the tribe of Manasseh is something uh, unique, something different from them and Simeon, is that the blessings from their forefather, who was uh, Jacob. And that comes in Deuteronomy chapter 33. The blessings of Jacob upon his sons. If you remember, this was right at the end of uh, Jacob's life and he lays his hands on most of his sons and he blesses them, right? And he talks about, the tri about Joseph, his son, um, about, you know, may the Lord bless his hand with precious dew from heaven above, with deep waters from below, uh, with the best that the sun brings forth, the finest the moon can yield, with the choicest gifts of the ancient mountains, all the good stuff, the, the fruitfulness, so the best gifts of the earth, the fullness, the favor of him who dwelt in the burning bush. Wow, what a statement. The favor of him who dwelt in the burning bush uh, rested upon Manasseh and Ephraim. Um, let all these rest on the head of uh, Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. Right? And it mentions specifically Ephraim and Manasseh. And all of these blessings flowed through to Manasseh. Right? So they were bountiful in number. They were bountiful in, in, in favor. Now we move over um, to, to, to Simeon. We contrast the Joseph's son's allotments with the allotments given to the tribe of uh, Simeon. Right? So if you look at this map here, the book of Simeon, is uh, uh, the book that the tribe of Simeon is was not enough that they had their own special plot of land. Instead, they were almost like an afterthought. They were given a piece of land within the tribe of Judah's portion, right? Jo Joseph, uh, Joseph, Joshua nineteen nine says the inheritance of the Simeonites was taken from the share of Judah because Judah's portion was more than they needed. Right? Judah says, you know what? We've got more than enough. Uh, nah, nah, you take this. Uh, you take this. Uh, don't, don't, don't feel so bad, okay? I know you don't have that many people. You just, just take this. So the Simeons received their inheritance within the territory of Judah. Uh, that, that was the, the fate of the tribe of, of, of Simeon, right? Why? Understand the backstory to Simeon. Simeon was one of Jacob's two sons uh, who, uh, taking revenge for the rape of their sister Dinah, they went and they attacked the city uh, uh, um, 
which was responsible for that rape, right? And the sons of Jacob, these two sons, the, 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 the sons of Jacob came upon these dead bodies. They looted the city where their sister Dinah had been defiled. And because of this, uh, Jacob uh, said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble to me. You have made me obnoxious to the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the people living in the land. And therefore, later on, um, the, the, the word that was pronounced upon Levi and Simeon was that was recognizing this, this spirit of violence in them. Their swords, they are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly for they have killed men in their anger. So not killed men for righteousness. That was the argument. Hey, we were just uh, aven uh, avenging our sister. Hey, wouldn't, shouldn't we do that for our sister? No, no, no. Um, you, in the heart of hearts, it was really the wrong reason. They, had, they, had, they were bloodthirsty. They were driven not by righteousness, but by anger. They even hamstrung the oxen. In other words, the innocent cattle, they go and pyak their legs so that even the cattle suffered for the, the error of, of the men, right? Cursed be their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. And this last line here actually happened to the Simeonites. They were scattered in Jacob and dispersed in Israel. Um, why? Because the tribe of Simeon had blood on their hands. They fought the battle with uh, not the righteousness, but with the wrong intent. And therefore, they were blacklisted by Jacob and they were blanked out by uh, Moses. Why do I say blanked out by Moses? Because um, if you see that, that second bullet point, that the tribe of Simeon will pay for this as long as they existed. In the numbers, we saw that they were the smallest and the weakest of the tribes. Um, but they were also left out of the blessing of Moses. In the book of Deuteronomy, that was the pronouncement of uh, Moses upon the tribes. Did I say Jacob earlier? It was a pronouncement of Moses, of blessings from Moses upon the tribes. And Simeon isn't even there. Right? So, so uh, if you understand, because of this, I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. The curse continued to extend to even in the time of uh, Moses, right to the end, and their number shrank and shrank by a significant number. Right? And if you look at the history, which is a, you can kind of draw the dots in the rest of the Old Testament. That wasn't the end of it for them. You know, even though they started off right inside Judah, if you read 2 Chronicles 15.9, it mentions later that some people from Simeon would later come back to Judah, which would imply that for some time they had already moved out of that weird island in the middle of Judah, of the southern kingdom of Judah, and had moved to the northern kingdom, which would mean that you remember, if you know your, your uh, history of the Old Testament, the, the ten northern tribes, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the northern kingdom of Israel were the ones that were dispersed, that vanished when it was, when it was exiled. So even though Simeon was originally a southern tribe, they made themselves a northern tribe. And that is when that, that last line of, of, uh, of, of Jacob came true. They would be scattered and dispersed and they would become the lost tribe of Simeon. Right? So you compare Manasseh and Simeon. Manasseh, they had the blessings from their forefather. Jacob, compared to Simeon, for because of all the wrong reasons, you know, the blood on their hands, their bloodthirstiness, their, their, their heart of evil, they were blacklisted by Jacob, they were blanked out by Moses. So, as we read this text, one of the questions we ask is, hey, how come Manasseh can go and ask for more and then they get it? And then how come Simeon can barely get an allotment? That's the discrepancy we're talking about here, right? And we ask ourselves, why like that? So we go back into the Bible like we've been doing. We go back into history. We search for the various mentions of their names. And we understand that Simeon was suffering the consequences of what had gone on before. Now, Natalie asked a question, which I'm just getting to right now. Why were Levites not dealt the same hand as the tribe of Simeon? Could Simeon have broken the curse? Yes, they could have. Consider the, consider, consider the Levites who were set aside by God. And they were told, you are, going, you are going to perform a different duty. I'm not going to count your numbers anymore. You're not going to get um, land allotments the same as every other tribe. So there are some consequences to, to, to your actions. However, because if you stay faithful to this uh, role, this task, this uh, job, this uh, position of being priest to the lands, that is the penance that you pay. That is the mercy that I will extend to you. Uh, that's my reading of why the difference in treatment between the two tribes. And, um, and, and if you know Moses himself, he was from the tribe of Levi, right? That's why Aaron was the high priest, because Aaron, Moses, their brothers, and Aaron was the, the high priest at that time, was, uh, uh, was the first, was the high priest. Um, because the Levites, they, 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 they uh, paid their dues, they, they recompensed, they, they uh, were given um, 
a chance to redeem themselves. One thing that we shouldn't, uh, we should be careful of asking is why is more mercy extended to, or, or more grace extended to a group than another group? That, that question is slightly awkward because you have to understand all mercy and all grace is already above and beyond what should have been extended. It's undeserved, right? As to the specific question of why Levi and not Simeon, I maybe haven't dug deep enough and maybe there are passages that describe that specifically why Levi and not Simeon. Um, I, I, I don't have that particular word. It would be great if someone can jump into the chat if you have uh, that particular one. But I just want to say that in the first place, any mercy and any grace is already above and beyond. There are consequences to pay. There's a price to pay to begin with, right? Levi, the tribe of Levites were extended that special mercy, that special grace, which they still had to live up to. They still had to fulfill the job. They still had to pay the price of not having the same kind of allotment. Uh, as, as, as the tribe of Simeon, okay? So this is what we see in the discrepancies. Out of the discrepancies, you start to see um, uh, spiritual principles. You start to understand the character and, and kind of how God, uh, how he moves and how he works. And you start to understand the heart of God and start to see, okay, if these discrepancies apply back then, if God is unchanging, how might these principles still apply now in life? Uh, I'm halfway through. I'm at ABC out of DEF. Okay. Special mentions, are there any names that seem to be given special treatment? Uh, and why would that be so? This one's a bit easier to deal with because it's very obvious and when you read through this, if you're, you're not talking about tribes, you're not talking about cities, then certain names keep pop, uh, will pop up and they have their own little uh, side story, right? Within the, the, the listicles, within the long list, right? Uh, in particular would be these, the daughters of Zelophehad, Othniel and Aksa, who was Caleb's daughter. Did I misspell daughter? Probably. Uh, and, and, and Joshua himself, right? And the, these, these three sets of people are singled out in these five chapters. They each have a unique journey, but I think there's a common learning point to be learned if we look at them not in isolation, but collectively as, as um, shall we say, as uh, intermissions within the larger narrative of the allotments. These three intermissions were intermitted there, not by accident, but there is a, there's a thread that connects them. So that's what we're going to look at through these special mentions, right? Um, I should really, oops. Okay, uh, I, 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 it's, it's over the words. I apologize for that. But basically, the story is, is, is this. In Joshua 17, uh, which you skimmed through earlier, Zelophehad, you know what? I'm just going to do everyone a favor by removing this text briefly. And uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, right. Okay, so we start with Joshua 17, which talks about Zelophehad, son of Zephyr, and he had no sons but only daughters. And uh, Zelophehad, Zelophehad died early on. The daughters came, and one of the daughters, curiously, was named Noah, which is strange to me. But anyway, they came to uh, Eliezer, to Joshua, and the other leaders, and said, Look, the Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance. So God, uh, Joshua gave them the inheritance, uh, you know, and these are the tracts of land. And um, the, the, the story began not here, but in Numbers 27 uh, 1 to 11. In Numbers 27, do I have it here? I don't have it here. Basically, in, in Numbers 27, even though Zelophehad did uh, not the right thing and he was uh, killed in action, basically, his daughters, they understood that they had this uh, uh, strong stirring, this strong conviction that they were not going to be bound by the sins of their father. Right? Uh, we understand it today, SOFCs, we learned this in RTF, uh, the uh, sins of our fathers and the resulting curses, right? Um, yes, I, I, sorry, I just checked the chat and I saw John, thank you so much for digging out. The Levites did as Moses commanded them, right? Uh, uh, and well, there was a blood, blood bath that day. So the Levites, um, they, they paid penance, shall we say, they, they, they repented through, through, through obedience. Simeon never quite did that. They never quite got there and they suffered as a result, right? So moving back on to uh, Numbers chapter 27, uh, the daughters of Zelophehad said, look, we shouldn't be, be, be penalized for the sins of our father. And the, the interesting thing about it is as they did that, Moses sought God and God said, yes, give them the inheritance. And because of that, they actually rewrote some of the commandments, some of the laws. The laws were changed such that if there are no sons in the land, the daughters are allowed to get an inheritance. Because of the boldness of these women, right, to, to say that we deserve an inheritance. We, why are we treated differently, right? Uh, the, all of the women in that land, were also given that special, um, uh, um, uh, that the law was changed in their favor, right? So you see what they had was there, this real boldness, right? And the same principle still applies now. Um, won't go too deep into this teaching. We teach it at length at RTF, but basically 
you are not bound by the error of your parents' ways, by the sins that they may have committed before, or, or, or your generations that were before, you know, whether it was alcoholism or divorce, you are not bound to them because you are not them. Now, granted, there is a propensity towards some of these things going on in your bloodline. And we know Satan, he likes to niggle away at the weak links, right? But you are not them. You're not bound by their curses. And just like the daughter of Zelophehad, you can boldly approach God's throne of mercy and break the curses, break the chains. The daughters, you know, Noah and all that, they, they went out and said, look, just because our father did wrong, why should we be left without land, without inheritance, without a chance to start afresh? You know, land is so important in Israel, right? And, and at, at the throne of mercy, at the throne of grace, that's what God gives out, you know. And, and um, one of the things, are, the, the third point there, God's promises always come to pass. It's just that, just understand the, the, the span of time that has elapsed since Numbers 27. So now we're talking at least five to seven years later. And, and at the time, they demanded something which they didn't yet have. They were on the other side of the Jordan and they, and they were saying, look, uh, once we get there, remember this promise. And now that the time was come, they came and they said, remember the promise. And Joshua says, yes, whatever Moses said to you still applies today because it was what God said. God's promises always come to pass, right? So that's the story of Zelophehad's daughters. Story of Othniel and Aksa. Um, Othniel, uh, kind of a long story here, but basically Caleb says, I'm going to give my daughter Aksa in a marriage to whoever proves himself by going forward and capturing uh, Kiriath Sefer, right? And uh, his nephew comes forward, Othniel. Uh, back then he does it and he gets the daughter in marriage. And uh, you get this little cute side story. Of, uh, of Aksa kind of exhibiting the same kind of, of spirit, the same kind of gumption as Othniel, right? She herself starts to uh, ask for things, you know? She goes up to the father and she says, uh, uh, she gets off the donkey and, and, and Caleb, the father, says, uh, hey, daughter, what can I do for you? And she goes up to, to, to daddy and says, daddy, um, give me a special favor. You gave me that, give me also this. And I'm thinking of my kids who are listening in the other room right now. And they know when they want a, a snack, they come to daddy and, it, you know, daddy, you know, we had lunch, but I'm still a little bit hungry. Uh, and then, you know, it depends on whether mommy is looking. <laughs> uh, you know, and you know, the daddy's heart is always to, just to give, right? It's a bit like that as well. And we learn how to approach uh, our father. Uh, we learn how to approach our father. Um, sorry, the text here is a little bit, yeah. Okay, we learn how to approach our father. We learn about how to approach him with boldness. We learn about being ready to fight the battles that God brings us through. And later on in uh, Judges chapter 3, we see Othniel come back out again. And again, I apologize for having covered the text, but this is not a major part of what we're learning today. But basically, one more time, the Israelites are in trouble again. They cried out to the Lord and God raised up for them Othniel again, who comes forward again. And God keeps coming forward to just help uh, uh, Othniel uh, because, you know, that spirit of Othniel, that, that, that boldness to step forward and to do that which God asks, and thereafter, the favor and the success that he's blessed with because in obedience, in, uh, in conviction, in courage, you know, be strong and of good courage, right? Uh, that's off nail. Again and again, we see this, okay? So this is the second special mention. Firstly, remember the daughters of uh, Zelophehad. With boldness, they came forward and they asked for something. Othniel and Aksa, with boldness, they came forward and they fought for something. They asked daddy for it, right? And the third mention uh, is of uh, Joshua. So Joshua, at the end of all this, he's had a tiring time. He's been, you know, drawing up his GRCs and everything. Uh, um, and, 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 you know, finally, it's, it's finally his turn. And he's figuring out, okay, which, which SMC will he place himself in, right? And he got, and, and he got a town that he asked for, Timnath Sarah. Timnath Sarah, uh, uh, fun thing to do, whenever you see a name in the Bible mentioned, go and Google the name. Uh, such meaning of Timnath Sarah. It means an extra portion. Or another way you can describe it is, is an abundant portion right? Uh, Joshua got an extra portion because this was his reward. This was his, uh, his, his uh, well done, good and faithful servant. His faith journey was uh, at least 45 years, right? I mean, at least 40 years in the wilderness, plus at least another five, seven years of conquest, plus whoever knows however many more years before and after that at this point in the, in the story, right? He got his reward. He got his reward. This in Timnath Sarah, this place of extra portion, abundant portion, uh, this is where Joshua would be buried. So these three examples of special treatment, right? The, the daughters of Zelophehad, Othniel and Akna, and now Joshua. Uh, I think I see these three common lessons in these three special mentions that were given. One is they all had this, uh, this same uh, boldness. This same boldness. You remember Joshua himself, I mean, it wasn't described in those verses about the boldness, but you remember he is the one who was uh, he spent more time in the, in, in, in the inner sanctum than even Moses did. He was there always in the presence of God. 
right? And, and we saw uh, for uh, Aksa, you know, she just approached Caleb, you know, just give me this, give me this. And, and uh, Othniel, he just, he, he just bullied it, you know, fine. If that's what it'll take, then that's what it will, will be done, right? Um, and we're reminded in the, in the new, under the new covenant, it's the same thing. In fact, it's an echo of, those, of, of that same posture. Come boldly onto the throne of grace so that you can obtain mercy, find help, find, find grace for, to help you in your time of need. Have that confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Don't come in there full of uh, self-condemnation and paise and say, you know, uh, God, uh, I know you're a God who wants to bless, but I'm not asking for too much. I just want like that, like that. You know, God, I don't want my whole family to be safe. I just want one, one member will do fine. One member will be do. Then, then, then I'm fine. After that, I won't try anymore. No, with confidence, go and then ask, ask God for uh, whatever is on his heart for you. Ask for the full measure of it, the full portion of it. Why? Because in Jesus, through faith in Jesus, we may enter God's presence with boldness and with confidence. These people in the Old Testament, these special mentions, they did the same thing in a very physical, territorial way. And in a new covenant, we do it in, 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 with, with confidence through uh, Jesus because he has opened all of those doors. He tore the veil for us, right? The second thing that I learned in common with these three special mentions uh, is that we, we, well, we have to be prepared to work and fight for it. You don't just sit there and like, God, you promise, you just give lah, right? You know, they all had to do something about it. Joshua probably had the, the longest, hardest slog of it, Joshua and Caleb. After all of those years, being the two spies out of 12 who, who just stood their ground, all of those years in the conquest, etc., cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, they had to fight, they had to work for their reward. Um, even even the, 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 the daughters of Zelophehad, even they had, to, they had to stand out, they had to be different, you know, they had to do something unheard of as women, you know, back then in the society, maybe not given quite the same voice. Uh, they, 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 they had to just, you know, why should we be deprived and we boldly, they went there and they had to do something to get their reward. And the third thing is a posture thing. Be assured of your reward inheritance. Be assured, know with a, a confidence that, you know what, the promises that God has for us are yes and amen. Why? Because God said them. Uh, one day Jesus will come back and he says he's coming back bringing his recompense with him to repay everyone for what he has done. In the end of days, the way I describe it is there'll be two books at the end of days. There's the book of life and there's the book of deeds. The book of life is recompense for if you have belief in Jesus. This is John 6, 29. Uh, the work is just to believe, right? Your name is there. That's the one book closed and you go to and you're up in heaven. But up in heaven, somehow there's a book of deeds. Right? And in the book of deeds, there is a reward and an inheritance that somehow uh, accrues according to the good deeds that we do on this earth. And even then, even on this earth, uh, Psalms uh, uh, 27, surely I'll see the goodness of God in the land of the living. There's a reward and an inheritance that happens even on this earth for that which we have done. Yes and amen. So isn't it funny that we read three completely uh, separate stories within the same extended passage? And out of them, we see the same principles being repeated again and again. So that's why I say sometimes you've got to be careful not to gloss over too quickly with some of these listical passages because sometimes there's a richness in, in the repetition and the exceptions that we can only glean if we really just stop and study, right? Uh, okay. Ah, e. Spirit's leading. As you read, does it feel like the Spirit is drawing your attention to any name or detail in the passage? Um, three steps to drawing out the meaning of a name. No name is accidental. I, uh, the example I like given uh, that is timely is the name Joshua. He wasn't originally named Joshua. He was originally named Hosea. Hosea just means a salvation, right? But his name was changed by Moses to Joshua, which means God is salvation or Yahweh is salvation. To, to, to place a different emphasis, the emphasis is not about me, I am saved. The emphasis in the word Joshua is he saves. Yahweh is the one who saves. It's the same for the name Jesus. The emphasis is on the fact that Jesus, Josh, uh, God is the one who will save. So the meaning of names in the Bible is, is rich, is particular, specific. It's not accidental, right? Uh, I think one of the things I preached before on, on the pulpit, the name Elijah, for example. The name Elijah, uh, the Lord is God. That was what was being uh, uh, shouted by the, by, by, during the actual 1 Kings 18. You know, it's a repetition of his name which came true. His name was a foreshadowing of that which he would do in his life, right? So when you see a name, especially in the Old Testament, uh, it's always fun to do this. Uh, three steps to draw out the richness of the meaning of the name, right? One, um, one thing you do is you look for where it appears elsewhere in the Bible, right? Uh, where does the, the, this, this, this name, this city or this name, where does it appear? And you start to try to connect the dots. What is the similarity between those situations and those contexts, right? 
Next is you use your good friend Google or your concordance or your, or your, or your favorite Bible study, uh, study Bible, and you find out what is the original meaning behind the original Hebrew or Greek name. You don't have to know Hebrew or Greek to know this. Uh, thanks to the internet, it helps, of course. Uh, but it helps when the advice I have for you is don't just stop at one website. Go to a few just to make sure you have a fuller sense of the meaning of the name, right? And then uh, with that name, you ask yourself, what is it that this name, this person, this city went through that applies in our life today, right? It was an age old word, but it has a modern day application, right? So give an example, Shiloh. Three steps to draw the meaning of a name. One, look for that familiar name. Now in Joshua chapter 18, uh, if you're wondering why I chose these passages, by the way, basically I just omitted all of the repetitive passages in Joshua 15 to 19. Whatever was left is whatever we're going through, okay, uh, out of these five chapters. So it's not that we haven't read them, we're reading them now, just that we're not reading the really repetitive parts, the, 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 the boundaries and all that, okay? So Joshua 18, we talked about how there's a whole assembly of the Israelites together at Shiloh, they set up a tent of meeting. Um, uh, and at this point, the seven Israelite tribes who have not yet received their inheritance come forward. Joshua instructs them, make a survey of the land. Return to me, I will cast lots for you here at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord. Uh, so the men went out there and they returned to Shiloh and they cast lots to sh in Shiloh. And then he distributed the land according to their tribal divisions. So I, was, uh, I don't have time. I was going to see whether we could just spend some time doing this uh, as a practice. But never mind, we'll just do this all together. Um, so where does Shiloh appear? Very easy way to do it is you go to your internet, your Google, and you start search Shiloh. Uh, this particular search result you see here is from Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway very, uh, very kindly suggests, you know, of all the passages, this is the one that you should really uh, read, right? And it suggests Genesis 49.10, which is the, where the name Shiloh is actually a, a, a messianic prophecy. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. In other words, they will always, the scepter, you know, they'll always be under some kind of... Um, oppression, right? Historic, uh, uh, national political oppression. Not a lawgiver from between his feet. Um, in other words, they'll always be bound to the condemnation by the law until Shiloh comes, until the Messiah comes, until the Savior comes and brings us from old to new covenant. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. So already we get a sense, Shiloh has this very messianic aspect to it. It's a, it's a word that we say in the Old Testament, but we start thinking about Jesus, the Messiah, because of that. Right? And then uh, the next thing you do is uh, you dig up the meaning. So this is me Googling uh, the word Shiloh. What does Shiloh mean? Right? Please, uh, there's a lot of websites on the internet. Find a trustworthy website. Find a few search results. Triangulate it. Find a uh, Logos study Bible or whatever it is that you can trust. Right? And, and, and what is the meaning of this word Shiloh? Right? So I, I basically, I, I took this snapshot, which I thought summed up most of what I found out there. Um, it was the first Israelite, major Israelite worship center before the first temple was built in Jerusalem. So it was, so to speak, the, the, the initial temple almost, right? Um, the, the meaning has various uh, uh, translations. Uh, the Messianic translation says that he whose it is, uh, or as a, as a pacific, not in the sense of the ocean, but in the sense of peace, you know, uh, pacify, the peacemaker, the one who brings peace, right? Uh, the name of Shiloh is derived from Shala, may be translated as Tranquility Town or Fair Haven or Pleasant Phil. Okay? So, if I triangulate all of that uh, Google results and all of those search sheets, I get this sense, and remember, you know when you, I don't know if any of you speak foreign languages, but when you speak foreign languages, you never fully get the meaning of that word in, when you translate it into English, right? Um, unless it's a, like, like a French word ambiance, which in English is ambiance, right? That's exactly the same. But there's many words where uh, you, you don't get the full sense of the meaning of that word. That's, for example, why we have the Amplified Bible. Amplified Bible, if you read it, there's all these brackets where it tries to flesh out the fuller meaning of that word in the original Hebrew or Greek. You know, when it says this, which kind of also has a sense of this, which kind of also has a sense of that, right? When we do that for the meaning of a name, the sense I get with this word Shiloh is this overall concept of, uh, of uh, yes, physically is a city, and it's a city of uh, which, which, where they assemble, and it's a city where, um, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they sought out the presence of God and in so doing, people got their reward. They, they, the land was finally at peace as the land was distributed. The, the, the way I just sum it up in my own personal explanation of this is something like when the Messiah comes, he brings peace to all who believe. Just let it sink in. Shiloh is a messianic word, right? They didn't know it then, of course, right? And the Jews to this day, they still don't know it, unfortunately, right? But they understand always when they came to Shiloh, Always when you come to the Messiah, if you believe, if you obey, his reward, his recompense, his gift is 
peace. Right? On the flip side, that's, that's, that's a positive application. There's a negative application. Uh, you know, when he comes and you obey, you get peace. If he comes and you don't acknowledge him as Messiah and you don't obey him as Messiah, then this peace that he offers, this, this settlement, this good pasture, this good land, whatever it is that he offers, well, then you forfeit that. Right? Um, and it actually plays out in the history of Shiloh. Right? So again, I said, you know, he searched for the, look for the familiar name, find it elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, in, 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 if you look at these, in this, this particular slide, you see all the good examples. They gathered there. There was the annual festival of the Lord at Shiloh. Uh, the first Samuel 1, year after year, they went and they made sacrifice at Shiloh. 1 Samuel 3, the Lord continued to appear through, at Shiloh and, they spoke, and he spoke to Samuel at Shiloh. 1 Samuel 4, we left the, the Ark of the Lord's Covenant was at Shiloh. These are positive examples. But then if you look further down uh, into the Bible, and remember the book of, uh, if, if you look further on, you realize, Shiloh becomes a, a, a negative word, a bad word. You know, at, at, at Psalms, we learn that's where the tabernacle of Shiloh was abandoned. And instead, uh, uh, no, sorry, that, that's, a, 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 that's, that's a, probably a, a bad reference. That's actually a good example. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the ones of Jeremiah, sorry. Uh, Jeremiah, you know, go there and see what has happened. Because while once they, the people acknowledge me as Lord and God, well, once they worship me there, after a while, wickedness took over. And they stopped to acknowledge me and they stopped and, and they stopped obeying me. And therefore, look what happened to Shiloh. Right? And here we see the flip side of the interpretation of it. Those who do not acknowledge, those who do not obey the Messiah, they forfeit the peace that he offers. And I learned, and we learn out of this that even just from this uh, exploration of the of the name Shiloh, that there are consequences to rebellion. We lose uh, his covering. We lose his uh, protection. We step away from his promises of peace and protection, right? In that name Shiloh, we see all this happening, right? Um, so again, just to go back on this point, the three steps, just to summarize this, to, to draw the meaning of name, you find wherever it's mentioned in the Bible and you connect all the dots. You see if there's a repeated theme, a repeated pattern. Um, you, you, uh, you dig up the meaning of the original word and then you ask, what do I apply? What can I possibly draw out of this? And what I drew out of this was, if I uh, acknowledge and obey my Messiah, I cannot wait for the Prince of Peace to pour out his peace on me. Of course, that's not the reason I acknowledge him. I acknowledge him because he is Jesus. He is the Christ. But then again, there's some uh, happy uh, byproducts of that relationship, right? And he brings peace. He says it outright, you know? Peace I, I, I bring to you. Peace, I, my peace I give to you. All right? And on the flip side, I got to be careful. I got to keep not being like the Israelites who, who abandoned Shiloh. I got to keep acknowledging and obeying him. Otherwise, I'm going to forfeit that goodness I, I enjoy under him. Right? Um, uh, where was I? So, my, the, well, I come now to the sixth point. Step back and summarize. Right? We went through, take, have a snapshot. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I've got three minutes to finish this. Uh, we spot the patterns, whatever is repeated in these listicles. We search for the parts that are exceptional discrepancies, right? We search for special mentions. We identify, hey, these people stand out, outstanding people. As the Spirit leads us, you know, we dive into the word Shiloh because I just felt led to, to dig a little bit deeper into the name. And there's so many names and words in these five chapters. Maybe you can uh, do your own if you want and try to explore a little bit more about some of those names. I uh, also did that for the name Joshua, for example. I unpacked the meaning and, and what it means uh, originally Hosea to then in this Bible, Joshua, and, and then to Jesus. And then we draw that line there, right? Finally, we take another step back. Now that we've, we took the big picture in A, we dive deep from B to E. Now we take another step back. What did we take away from this whole uh, studying and learning? And I know in this one and a half hours, because I raced through it, because it is five chapters to get through, um, maybe, maybe it's, it's not easy to see that big picture right now. But I encourage you, whether it's these five chapters, and, and it's not a bad thing, you've got one week till the next uh, chapter comes, the next edition of WoW comes. Go into these five chapters and see if you can draw different, uh, if you can write up your own um, uh, uh, principles, your own uh, takeaways, your own thoughts on it, and see if out of here, you have a, a big picture of what's going on in here uh, through studying even these very difficult uh, passages, which are the listicles, right? Um, and I'm just going to give you my, my, my summary versions, my key principles, what I took out of these five chapters. The first one is uh, from all that we've learned. And we, this was repeated again and again. We talked about the Manasites. We talked about the daughters of Zelophehad. We talked, of course, about Joshua, Caleb, and, and, his, uh, and his offspring after that. God loves his people. And what he commands us to do, you know, go into the promised land, take it. Uh, it's for our own good. 
And, and this interesting point, the sub point to that, the rewards are both proportionate to our obedience. In other words, as we are righteous, the righteous get a certain uh, reward, right? And yet it's also disproportionate in the sense of, uh, um, we talked about the Levites, for example, they should have had the same uh, treatment consequence as the, as the Simeonites. But there's also this extra asterisk element that we cannot calculate and that we cannot take for granted and that we cannot take as a given, which is grace, which is mercy, undeserved favor, right? And, and, and somehow the rewards, that also plays into the calculation, into, into, the, into, the, the, the circums, uh, into the consequences of what we reap, right? There is what we reap, which kind of makes sense. Those who, Joshua, it kind of makes sense. For all he did, he gets that city. It kind of makes sense. And there's some who, they don't. They just go up, just, just sort of uh, like the daughters of Zelophehad. All they did was they just appealed to the mercy of God. And they got it, right? So God loves his people and he will reward. He, he wants to lavish. His commands are for our good. Um, and knowing that, we can choose to respond in two ways. Taking across all that we've learned from all of these people, we can either confidently approach his throne of grace and mercy for help and favor, like all those names you see mentioned there under pointer one, or we can choose our own way. And this comes at a price, like the Simeonites, like the various groups who failed to evict the various Jebusites and the Canaanites as instructed, as well as those in the later years, we learn not from these five chapters, but in the study of a name in the later part of the Bible, those who abandon that original um, passion for, for, for Shiloh being a place where the presence of God was, right? So we can confidently approach the throne of grace, or we can choose our own way. We saw this throughout these five chapters. So how will we choose to respond to that? How will we choose to respond to the grace of God, the goodness of God, and the commandments of God? So you see what I did there. I went through steps A, B, C, D, and E. And after going through steps A, B, C, D, and E, I went back, I went to step F, which is basically step A all over again, but now with more input, now with more uh, understanding. And now with the extra understanding, rather than it being just a raw, you know, a raw conclusion or a raw summary, I draw all of these lines between these five chapters. And beyond these five chapters, I make sure that the lines extend throughout the gospel context, throughout the redemptive narrative of the story of, of the Bible. And it applies. All of these things that I say apply all the way from Genesis through to Joshua 15 to 19, all the way through to the book of Revelations. God loves us and his commands are always for our good. We can choose to respond in two ways. We can either uh, acknowledge him, obey him, or we can ignore him, reject him. And then the question remains for us today, whether it's the initial belief or is in the daily discipleship, how are we going to respond to God? So you see, the, 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 the principles you draw from this can never contradict the rest of the Bible, right? And this is what I got out of these five chapters. Uh, and one final point just to, to make here is we shouldn't read uh, these uh, allotment of land chapters. We, it was actually Joshua 13, the allotment of land started, right? Don't read them merely as about lessons on how to buy property. You know, uh, you know, oh, you know, market, I don't know if it's going to be a V-shaped recovery. No, no, this is not what it's about. I know there's a lot of territory and cities being mentioned here. But we shouldn't read this about being material gain, right? This was their mission for that moment. The whole conquest, and for them, it was very much a territorial thing. It was literally territory, property, right? But that was their mission for them. What is our mission in this moment, right? And our mission in this moment is to know Christ, and to make him known, or in our mission statement, we rephrase that, is, which is to share Christ as we mature in him. That's how BBTC phrases it, right? That's our mission statement. And therefore, what is our promised land? What is our reward? Our reward is always this. Uh, Philippians 3, right? I want to know Christ. Our reward is always to know Christ better. Our promised land, our, our, what we're really aiming for, what we're shooting for, is not for... It's not for the, 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 the city of abundant portion, uh, but it is the metaphor of abundant portion. It is the person of abundant portion, who is Jesus Christ. And the territory that we're talking about is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, we're not looking at, you know, where's the next uh, um, uh, religious land plot that BBTC can buy, although that might happen, who knows, you know. But what we're really talking about here is we're not talking about conquest of land anymore. We're not talking about conquest of material gain. Uh, if our mission is to share Christ and as we mature in Him, then our promised land, as we ourselves know Christ better, is to make other people know Christ more. And that's the territory that we're really, we should really be focused on enlarging. And the good thing we know it is, is that God helps us with it, just as He helped Joshua with it. And we close here with that final verse in Joshua 19.51.
which is, and so they finished dividing the land. And here ends the study of the chapters of Joshua 15 to 19, a lot of allotments. Um, and out of that, we realize, hey, the allotment isn't just land and the promises, they still apply today to us. And I wonder what amazing things are going to happen to us as we start applying some of these principles, some of these lessons into our personal life, into our family, into our church ministry, into whatever we're doing out there. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I've just spoken for an hour and a half. I think uh, I'm going to hang around here. I don't mind hanging around to answer a few questions. But as it is right now, I'm just going to close us in prayer. And as I close in prayer, uh, feel free to leave if, if you know, it's, it's past your bedtime already. I, I overshot by about five minutes. But if you want to hang around and we can just talk about this and I'm going to make one answer all the questions anyway, right? So let me close in prayer. If you want to hang around for like 10, 15 more minutes, we can still chat about some of these things. Uh, let me pray. Father God, we just thank you that in the, in the type of Joshua, we see that picture of Jesus. Jesus, you truly, you are the one who has the victory. You have the victory and you are here to lead us into the promised lands, into green pastures, into good places. We see in this study that it's not always going to be straightforward. It's not going to be easy because there are things that you want us to do. You have placed a mission onto us, a commission on, onto us. But we thank you that what's going to help us win every battle it's not our own strength, our own knowledge, but yours. Just as you, God, you were there with the Israelites in the conquest of the promised land. For our missions for today, we know you will be here for us, helping us through every situation, whether it's this circuit breaker, uh, the, the, the phases, uh, the COVID situation, or beyond into the new normal. We know that whatever land of promise awaits, you are going to be the one who will help us there. For this, we are thankful. For this, we are grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.